keeping up on Seattle area politics is tough. Who has time to sit through a three-hour council meeting and sort out which decisions will affect you most? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Well, what if getting caught up on current events was as simple as getting a cup of coffee with some city hall insiders who know which stories are hot and which are not? Welcome to Seattle News, Views, and Brews. And away we go. Welcome to Seattle News, Views, and Brews, the podcast that gives you an inside look at Seattle area politics while wearing industrial strength protective goggles. I'm Brian Callanan, your host. I'm also a host on Seattle Channel. The views expressed here are my own. We are recording today's podcast yet again with remote technology and wearing at least a headset and a shirt. From what I can see is my co-host, Kevin Schofield of Seattle City Council Insight. Hello, Kevin. I I will confirm, I am wearing both a headset and a shirt. (laughs) And that's all he's going with, I love it. Uh, Thanks also to City Grind Espresso, the coffee stand on the first floor of City Hall, shut down in COVID pandemic mode, of course, but still our background noise sponsor. So help them out, get a gift card if you can. Also, if you like what you're hearing, I'm here to tell you about the greatest nation in the world, a large donation on Patreon. That's the funding we run on. We need your help, so make sure you bring that in, and thank you very much for it. All right, turn the key, fire up the engine. It's time for Right Here, Right Now. All right, as we're heading into the last week of May here, Kevin, we're talking about legislation around sweeps or cleanups of unauthorized homeless encampments, and Council Members Sawant, Mosqueda, and Morales are pushing for a bill that the Council will be deliberating on, it looks like, this week. Now, since early March, the mayor has reduced the number of sweeps the navigation team has been doing, saying they're only happening in extreme circumstances. But the council wants to take this a step further, based on a recommendation from the CDC that says removing these camps simply disperses homeless people into the community and potentially could spread coronavirus. So, Kevin, I want to talk about what this bill is calling for and how the mayor's office is firing back. I know we're hearing some familiar arguments here, but it's now very much in this public health uh, COVID frame, at least is how the council is seeing it. Yeah, that's right. So there were certainly a number of council members who were generally opposed on principle to, you know, what they call sweeps, removals mm-hmm. of homeless encampments. Uh, and now they're uh, they're buoyed a little bit uh, within the COVID pandemic because the CDC has come back, uh, come out and said, uh, you know, their guidance is unless the government can provide appropriately socially distanced shelter, whether that's individual hotel rooms mm-hmm. or really uh, you know, de-densified congregate shelter. Yeah. Then removing encampments right now is likely just going to spread COVID further by dispersing people into the community. Mm-hmm. So they're, you know, recommending that really unless um, unless there is socially distant shelter available, try not to remove shelters. Right. So right. the city since March has removed four, right. including two last week. Just so this past week, they, right. So they really have not done a lot of them, mm-hmm. right? And not as many as before, for sure. Certainly not as many as before. You know, the ones last week, what the, the city is saying is that, you know, they, they, they prioritized these because there were specific public safety risks around that. Yeah. And in particular, criminal activity. There yeah, been the, in the Chinatown ID, one right, them, right. Mm-hmm. Right. So that, that was what for them, at least what they say now, is push them over, over the edge white to do that. But the council members, particularly council member Herbold, who said, well, you know, their rationale for, for and, 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 you know, criteria for doing these seems to be kind of a moving target depending mm. on, you know, what they want to do. So right. I'm a little concerned about, you know, whether they're working backwards and trying to sort of rationalize a criteria that, you know, to let them do what they want to do anyway. Yeah. Um, so, so, what Morales says she's doing with this legislation, she's really the primary sponsor on this, right, right. is trying to actually codify what the new rules are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there are questions, and in, in fact, Deputy Mayor Mike Fong sent a long tirade letter yeah. to the council members compl- complaining about this, this legislation, um, arguing that it really goes too far in some ways. Yeah, said it was because, one of the worst pieces of legislation he's seen in 20 years. So Yeah, so, yeah. you know, the, the legislation um, would not allow communicable disease as a reason for removing a, an encampment. Mm-hmm. So, you know, recently we had a Ballard Commons Park right. encampment that was right. going quickly, and there was a hepatitis A uh, outbreak in that mm-hmm. park. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, this ordinance would not allow them to remove it for that reason. Cr- uh, public safety and criminal activity 
not a reason that would be allowed yeah. under the, under this legislation. And it says that there, you know, if there is less than four feet of sidewalk clearance, which is what the, the council is trying to call for here, yeah, that mm-hmm. uh, in this legislation, and that that's enough. And uh, the deputy mayor said that in some circumstances is not enough. Right. Right. So we like yeah. to be able to clear the entire sidewalk, even if right. it's, you know, even if it's wider than that. Right, right. I want to try to take it next level here, Kevin, in terms of trying to vote this through the city council. Are there seven votes there for one? And the second part of it is because this is emergency legislation we're talking about, we need to have concurrence from the mayor. And it doesn't really sound like we have that right now. Yeah, I, I think there's there's going to have to be a lot of negotiations behind the scenes, particularly yeah. the mayor's office, to try to get to seven. I, th- I, I, uh, I think there's a fairly good chance it will get to seven mm-hmm. uh, in the just in the council itself. I think Peterson will be a no. Yeah, probably. I'm feeling that too. Whereas there's a good chance she'll be a no yeah. on this. Yeah. And the others, it's just hard. All, all seven could go the other way. So it's, it's really hard to say. I think it depends on whether they clean up some of these things. Yeah. Uh, but then I think it's very likely the mayor, uh, unless they do some great negotiating behind the scenes, is going to mm-hmm. say no on this. Right? Yeah. In which case yeah. it's dead. So, you know, if, and if they know that, you know, is this just political posturing or is this, you know, actually a, a legitimate attempt to try to get some legislation through? Right. We will see. And I will tell you also, I talked with Dan Strauss a little bit about this, the council member from District District 6 there, about what happened in Ballard, etc. We talked about it on the Council Edition show for Seattle Channel for this month. Coming soon. Shameless plug. Now over. Okay. <laughs> uh, moving on to uh, uh, another piece here that the council's been working on. Sick and safe leave for gig workers. We're talking Uber, Lyft, DoorDash here. We mentioned this in the podcast last week, and now we have some more details. So, Council Member Mosqueda, sponsor of this, originally wanted the council to vote on it before the end of May. That's been delayed a little bit, and I think for good reason, because, Kevin, you pointed out on Seattle City Council Insight, seeing some of the details, there's a lot of complexity here. It's not just, yeah, let's have the companies pay for sick days, for gig workers, one day for every 30 days work, and let's keep this in place for six months after the state of emergency is over. Kevin, talk to talk to me about what you're seeing here. Some of these complexities. Well, you know, the rationale at a high level is, for this is actually simple and very justified, which is, mm-hmm. you know, this is about Uber drivers and it's about food delivery drivers like yeah. Postmates and Uber Eats and and you know all those. Yep. And if those folks are sick with COVID, potentially with COVID right now, we don't want them out there driving and right. delivering food and taking right. people, you know, being being in their cars with with people. Right. Mm -hmm. We don't want these folks being vectors for further transmission of this disease. Mm -hmm. Right. But if this is their source of money, right, Mm -hmm. they're going to be out there. And, you know, if they if they need to do that to put food on the table. Right. And and pay the rent, they can be out there doing that. Yeah. So this is a this is a chance like we do in general, with you know, public uh, with with, um, paid sick and safe time Mm -hmm. to, you know, make a public health intervention to right. try to stop these kinds of things from happening. We want sick people staying home. But, you know, that's it. There's still rough edges on this bill that need yeah. to be worked on, right? Yeah, so, the, the way that you know, compensation is kind of computed here, it's very interesting. Yeah, so, the, you know, the, the, the basics of it is uh, someone would accrue one day of paid sick and safe time for mm-hmm. every 30 days that they'd work, which, right. you know, if you worked standard, you know, 20 days a month, that would work out to about nine sick and safe days a year, the same as Full-time employees, basically, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. right? But what they get paid for on that one day is really based on a complex formula yeah. that, that, you know, I, I looked at it and said, I can think of, you know, several ways in which this could get gamed by people. So right, I, right. I, I think I think there's a bunch more work that needs to be done on this. Yeah. Right? And the, uh, there are a bunch of council members that thought the same way. So Mosqueda wanted to turn around in a week. Uh, several of her colleagues said, I really need like at least another week to look at this. And, yeah, and yeah. so she backed down on that and said, yep, yeah, happy. Sure. We'll take and, another week. On it. And the other piece of this too, Kevin, I, I think this enforcement bit with regard to the office of labor standards, important to point this out too. There's an office that is getting a lot of work over the past oh, yeah. couple of years because so many different labor laws are going into place. I just wonder if they, if they can handle the load. I mean, that's the, that's the other piece of this. Well, they can't right now. They are, yeah. they are understaffed right now. They've right. got open positions and there's a hiring freeze at the city because of the, because of the budget crisis right now. And, so and COVID, yeah. they, can, mm-hmm. they can't even fill the open positions they have right now to cover all the work they have now. And so yeah. if this comes in and there's suddenly a bunch more work for them, they're really going to be under the gun. Okay. All right. So a lot still ahead with that. We'll see what council member Mosqueda and the council does there, but let's move on to now hear this. 
All right, so this is where we review some of the action over the last week and listen in to what city leaders are saying about it. And so, Kevin, here's our Zen question of the day. If a council member holds a committee meeting and no other council members show up, is it still a meeting? Council member Shama Sawant put that to the test last week, holding a meeting of her Sustainability and Renters' Rights Committee, but no other council members showed up, thus no quorum. She, of course, is upset about the big business tax she's been trying to push through as emergency legislation. Council President Lorena Gonzalez, as we talked about last week, others on the council clearly are saying that big business tax bill does not meet the guidelines of the governor's proclamation when it comes to the Open Public Meetings Act and having the council's business focused on COVID or other matters routine and necessary. So Council Member Sawant is in a very interesting position here. Here's a sampling of what she said at the top of her so-called committee meeting. As a council member, as many of you may have observed, I generally follow these protocols and conventions, but not when they are used by the political establishment as a lever to try and hinder ordinary people and grassroots movements, as they are in this case with all council members boycotting this committee. I, I'm, I'm going to let that line go about what she said. I generally follow the rules. I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm moving past that. Let I, that go I for now. I, I won't. Let me just say, <laughs> please. She, yeah. yeah, she voted for those rules. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Well, let, let's dive into this then. What well, your your big concerns about this in terms of what she's saying? Well, so I mean, let's just get the facts out the right. Yeah, you know, as you pointed out, the meeting was illegal under the governor's proclamation, and the you know the state attorney general has, you know, has made clarifying guidance as to how to interpret those, you know, that proclamation and yeah. said, you know, it's legal. The city attorney's office, Seattle city attorney's office has given guidance to the city council saying, you know, it, it's legit. You mm-hmm. got to follow it. Yep. And, you know, two weeks ago, Suwant trotted out her own personal attorney who's a labor attorney. And yes, as near as I can tell, doesn't have any experience whatsoever in open public meetings act, right. gov- you know, emergency proclamations from the governor. Right. Say, no, no, it's totally illegal. And they can't do it. And so, yeah, so she's kind of off on her own path. Right. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and it is always interesting to me and ironic when lawmakers, you know, one yes. of the nine people in the city who actually get to write laws mm-hmm. are telling people and demonstrating by their own behavior. It's like, Nah, I'm only going to follow the laws that I want to follow. Right, right, right. What message does that send to everybody? It's like, is she telling everybody else, no, you should also just follow the laws that you want to follow, right? Yeah. Even the ones that I write. If you don't like the laws that I write, nah, you shouldn't follow it. Right, right. Because I, I want to take a closer look at that, Kevin, because I thought you raised a really interesting point uh, on, on your website there. There's an equity issue here in terms of this whole idea of these meetings where we're doing Zoom or whatever else and doing things online. Some people can access them, but can all people access them? I don't think that's the case. And I think that's the big issue here. When you talk about equity, Council Member Sawant talks about that a lot, but in this case, it doesn't apply or what are you seeing there? I thought that yeah, was a I very think, interesting dichotomy. Yeah, it's a, it, it's another interesting irony of this, right? Is Council Member Sawant and you know, all, of, all of her colleagues on the, on the council mm-hmm. rightfully are champions for equity and making yep. sure that that uh, you know, there's equal access to service, and we're yes. not, we don't have sort of disparate impacts in the way the city delivers services to mm-hmm. to the residents of Seattle. Mm-hmm. And this is a case where you know the the Open Public Meetings Act talks about meetings being in person and and requiring you know the public to be able to attend those meetings, right? Yeah. And and part of that is the equity issue, right? Yeah. Anybody can show up in person, and it's great that there are all these other ways to access it too, and more people can access it. That's just good for good government in general. Sure. Mm-hmm. But the you know the 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 um, ability of the people. And by the way, if I remember correctly, the Open Public Meetings Act was passed by voter initiative. Mm-hmm. It wasn't right. passed right. by the legislature, right? This yeah. is the voters saying we want access in person to these meetings, yeah. right? Yeah. And for you know them to say, no, nah. and, and literally, you know, a couple, over the last couple of weeks, so Wanda said on, on, on several occasions, including at a press conference with her attorney, mm-hmm. that, um, you know, it's crazy to think that these meetings aren't open because people can just, you know, they can go online and view them. It's like, mm-hmm. mm, Some people can. Not, every, not everybody can do that. Yeah, right. yeah. And I guess, uh, bottom line it here, Kevin, I think this feels like, to me, this committee meeting that was not a committee meeting basically serves as fodder for this tax Amazon movement, which still exists out there, in which we will likely, if the signatures go through, et cetera, see something on the ballot in the fall. Is that what we're talking about now? 
Yeah, it's a uh, well. I mean, we'll see if the council does pick it up again when the governor's proclamation yeah, yeah, gets lifted. Yeah. And Councilman, uh, Council President Gonzalez has been lobbying the governor's office heavily to make a bunch of changes. And I think, from what I hear, Association of Washington Cities is yes. kind of getting behind that. So there's some effort to try to change that so they can get back to business. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, I, th- I think you're right. Basically, what what Councilmember Swant did last Thursday was a campaign rally, mm-hmm. right, uh, yeah. in in council chambers, and. Um, She's trying to keep her, her her campaign alive for this thing. The ballot initiative is also kind of struggling. You know, they need to collect printed handwritten signatures. Yeah. And, you know, in fact, this past weekend, they started what they call an Amazon Tax Prime campaign. Yes. Where they had volunteers willing to actually go hand deliver copies of printed <laughs> petitions to yeah. people in order to collect their signatures. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see what happens there. But uh, a lot still ahead with that piece about the Open Public Meetings Act. So we'll keep, tra- keep tabs on that. Also last week, just to catch you up on a couple things here, folks, the City County Regional Homeless Board met virtually. So that's happening. Also, Council President Lorena Gonzalez led the charge to pass a non-binding resolution asking the state to allocate at least $100 million to provide emergency help to undocumented workers in our state. These are workers not getting a stimulus check. In many cases, they're working in some fairly dangerous conditions. We'll see how the governor and legislature deal with that in the months ahead. But I want to focus on another, at least for now, non-binding move from the city council here in Seattle to establish Internet for All. This one's really interesting, Kevin, because Councilmember Peterson is sponsoring a resolution. So it's not directly tied to the COVID crisis. So it's not emergency legislation like this other stuff we've been talking about. He's asking the city's IT department to research what it would take to allow everyone in Seattle to have high speed broadband access. Now, the city has looked at this before over the past few years. And Councilmember Peterson isn't necessarily saying, hey, Let's, you know, make sure we have access for everybody and forget about uh, Comcast. The city's going to run this thing. He's asking to get a better study done because technology is changing quickly, basically. Yeah, well, and that's a part of it. And, and you know, and people's adoption of that technology has changed. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they did a study on, on, on municipal broadband back in 2015 and they came yep. back and said, you know, it doesn't really like look like it would be feasible. It would cost about a half a billion dollars to build it out. Mm-hmm. And then they would have to get at least 40% of residents of the city to subscribe to it through through this versus yeah, just to you know, break some even other right right, in, right you know in order for this to be to you know to to break even on this yeah, right yeah. and you know but that a lot of technology has changed there and so that's changed um, 2 years ago they did a study just looking at who has internet access in this city right. and they found that 95% of households in Seattle actually have internet access at home now. Mm-hmm. Uh, for low-income households, it was about 75%. So there's still some disparity there. There's still yeah. a gap there and needs to get filled. Right. But then the, you know, the other interesting part about all this is that you know there's there's a whole new generation of mobile technologies mm-hmm. now, what we're all hearing and referred to as 5G. Right, right. And 5G mobile technologies, it could go as high as 10 gigabits per second, right? Okay. Which is a lot faster than a lot of us are getting in, you know, fixed, you know, broadband at home right now through yeah. Comcast or CenturyLink or anything yep. like that. So mm-hmm. it may be that, that, you know, 5G technology really takes off you know fiber to your home becomes just a silly thing that we look back and go why did we ever do that right right you just have you know mobile high-speed mobile technology everywhere so so that's going to be a really interesting wrench in this whole work yeah you know about how that plays out Mm -hmm. because there are these competing technologies and yeah and that makes it a much more challenging case to be made that the city should go do a municipal broadband. Kind of right, thing. right. And I, I think, too, it's really come to the fore when we start talking about what's happening during COVID, people accessing meetings, let's say, for the city council, or perhaps even more importantly, accessing telemedicine. And I know the state AG has been talking about that, too. I think right. we're really seeing it during this crisis that more people need this because this is a crucial service, sometimes a life and death type service for people who, who might not have access. And, and it's really the big three. It's, it's telework got a lot of people yeah, doing a lot of right. work from home right now. Mm-hmm. It's remote schooling, right? We've got all these kids, yeah. you know, and, and both, you know, uh, you know, K-12 and college kids, um, you know, studying from home right now. And it's telemedicine, mm-hmm. right? Those are kind of the big three. Yeah. And, you know, the thing that I, I think is a really good chance we're going to come out of this COVID crisis thinking really differently about those three. And we may, you know, we may never go back to yeah. the way it was on those three. 
Yeah, we will see what happens there. And if you're listening to this podcast, we're coming at you with 1.21 gigawatts of power. That's because we use a flux capacitor. But I'm going to move on to our next piece here. What's next? All right, so here we go. We're talking about something that the council and other agencies around Seattle are going to be working on thanks to a recommendation and a meeting that was held by the Third Door Coalition. This is a group of businesses, homeless advocates, government officials talking about changing the conversation on homelessness, not necessarily ending it, let's say, but focusing on chronic homelessness, Kevin. I thought this was very interesting, a new approach, and I thought that there were some voices and faces at the table that showed some promise here, maybe. Yeah, it was, you know, what they called, they call themselves an unlikely alliance. Okay, right? yeah. Of uh, some homeless providers, mm-hmm. uh, of uh, big contingent from the hospitality industry at yes. the table, um, some local advocates. One of them was uh, Sarah Rankin, who uh, is Seattle a law, law yeah. professor mm-hmm. at Seattle University and, it, you know, runs their uh, homeless advocacy you know, legal project there. Yeah. Um, and really, you know, it started a few years ago with all of them getting the table and just saying, okay, let's, we don't have to agree on the reasons, mm. right? But we, but if we can find some common ground about things that we think are good ways to move forward, let's move them forward. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that has been really clear to me over the last few years is as you continue to evolve the way we address the homeless crisis in mm-hmm. the city, it's what's become effective has been particular solutions that are focused on a sub demographic. Mm-hmm. So if we if we treat the whole homeless population as one kind of if undifferentiated yeah, right, mass, right. we don't we don't make progress on it. When we yeah. say, okay, what do veterans need? Right? Yeah, right, what do right, youth right, right. and young adults need? Mm-hmm. And and so what what they've really focused on is a group called the chronically homeless, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. People who've been homeless for at least a year or, you know, a total of 12 months over the last three years Mm -hmm. and who have some kind of disability that prevent them from working steadily and from, uh, in many cases, from maintaining housing steadily. Right, right, right. right. So this is about 6,500 people have been identified in this group in King County, about 30% of the overall population, but certainly some of the most visible, vulnerable people in that population. Yeah, and and there's a there's a very good, effective solution for them, and it's called permanent supportive housing. Right. And, you know, it's not cheap, yeah. but uh, right now... 1.7 1, 1. billion, just about. 1.7 billion yeah. to, is, is part of their proposal for how to actually really solve that challenge. Not just mm-hmm. sort of incrementally increase investment, but say, yeah. okay, let's have a hard target, right? Yeah. Let's get to the point where we have enough permanent supportive housing mm-hmm. for everybody we believe is going to be, you know, in that community that needs that over yep. the next five years. And by the way, there's some people who are not chronically homeless mm-hmm. who take advantage of permanent supportive housing. There are elderly people in our community. There sure. are other people who are really, um, you know, in, in danger of becoming homeless in a mm-hmm. lot of ways who yep. really need that kind of wraparound services around their house, housing. And yeah. it's not free housing either, right? They pay 30% of their income. Right, so right. Retirement program or... Social Medicare, security checks, you know, social right? Security yep. checks, whatever mm-hmm. it is that, that that's doing that, right? Yeah. So um, they have proposed a public partner, uh, private partnership, mm-hmm. with contributions from the business community, from yeah. state, from the county, from the city, to get to 1.7 billion dollars. Yeah. So that over five years, we could we could build out 6,500 new units of yeah. supportive housing, which, by yeah. the way, would be a really great thing to do in a recession because that right, would be a right. big, that would also be a big jobs program. And, yeah. and in some ways, that makes us a really interesting sort of contrast mm-hmm. to the tax animal design. I was right? just going to say, is, yeah, this, which is this, also being positioned mm-hmm. as a jobs program. Right right? right, 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 right. But this, but this new program feels a little bit more like a win-win rather than demonizing Amazon, demonizing these big businesses that. Love right. them or hate them, they they're providing yeah. a lot of jobs for our area. Yeah. Now the you know through door coalition has got the hospitality sector right you know at the table right now. Chad McKay's you know, in the a- house. Amazon, right. mm-hmm. Microsoft, the other big tech companies, the other big employers like you know Warehouser, mm-hmm. they're not at the table yet. Right? Yes. But yeah. and so this week was really their big unveiling to say, okay, we spent the last two years really doing the data, doing the analysis, Mm -hmm. getting a a really good solid picture of what it would take to do this and a whole bunch of ways that we could reduce the cost of 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 building out permanent supportive housing. Yeah. This is what we want to go accomplish. With yeah. This. Yeah. Fascinating. And I thought there was a great observation you had it in Seattle City Council Insight too. In terms of reducing costs, the operational cost to support one chronically homeless person in permanent supportive housing, about eighteen eighteen thousand dollars a year. 
That's the same as the cost of incarcerating someone in the jail in King County for three months or just three days staying at Harborview Medical Center. So that's right. uh, and this is, and yeah, that's, a big, big. that's a big talking point that the yep. federal coalition is using around yeah. this and pointing out that, you know, the a lot of, and, and council member Lewis, who is part of their, their, their press conference yes. unveiling this really kind of hammered on this point saying, yeah. look, there are a lot of people out there who think of jail as the free way of dealing with, you know, the, the free solution to dealing with chronic homelessness. Mm-hmm. We'll just, just arrest them, get them off yeah. the streets. Yeah. And jail is way more expensive mm-hmm. than permanent supportive housing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's amazing stuff. I, I got to say, though, Kevin, all this good talking about what's happening in city government is making me very hungry. So let's mm-hmm. wrap up our show, as we do, by getting some baked goods going on. I know you've been in uh, pandemic baking mode. Well, it always seems like you're in pandemic baking mode because you're always baking. What, what do you have this time around? I've got one of my favorite recipes that I actually haven't made in a while, but I, okay. put, I pulled it out of a nearly 50-year-old cookbook. Oh, nice. Um, and it's coconut banana bread. And Whoa. Just, Wouldn't is, have thought of that combo. What's going it, on there? It, well, I mean, coconut makes everything better. Uh, you're Especially a big coconut guy. Coconut. That's right. That's right. To, to, coconut, you know, toasted coconut is just, it's just such an amazing it's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Smell and flavor makes your whole house just smell great, <laughs> and, and it tastes great, and, and it improves almost everything. It's tricky because you know when you're toasting coconut, it can mm. go from like not cooked to toasted to burnt yeah. in about thirty seconds. <laughs> right, you know, right, right, right. You got to be watching it really carefully. It's like, okay, it's brown, it's brown okay. enough, and okay. I'm going to pull it out right now. But okay. you do that, and then you know you can bake it into things, and it's just it's just really. really great. That's magic. Uh, my daughter Emma has been baking up a storm too, and. Uh, she, you know, that lemon pound cake stuff you get from Starbucks, let's say, or whatever else, yep. great yep. lemon filled with the sugar on top. She made one of those, but then she dropped in a couple of secret ingredients and, uh, oh, cool. I'd have you guess, but I, I just really want to take a bite. I'm going to tell you what they are. She put in some sour cream into the mix, which I thought was interesting and some lemon instant pudding in the mix. Mm. Now I will say as the mouth waters here. It comes across as ever so slightly underbaked, but that's kind of the way I like baked goods. So mm-hmm. um, I'm, I'm going to take a bite here. This is good stuff. Oh yeah. So while you're oh. biting, so yeah. One of the please. I think I may have talked about this on the on the podcast before. Yeah. We can't taste flavors directly. Mm. Right. 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 Got to deliver them. Mm-hmm. They need to be dissolved into mm-hmm. either water, mm-hmm. acid, fat is the other one. Fat right? or alcohol. Right. 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 Water, right. acid, fat, or alcohol. Mm-hmm. So. A lot of times, when you sort of add an ingredient, it's like uh, an ingredient into a recipe, and suddenly it's like, oh, I, it tastes completely different, mm-hmm. is because you added something that allows a whole bunch of flavors that were just yes. sitting there quietly in there yeah. to suddenly get dissolved so that we can taste them, right? Yeah. So that's actually, you know, it turns out when you add something like a vanilla extract to a recipe, mm-hmm. yes, yes, it may it may not be the vanilla that's making it. Pe- peak it may be the alcohol that's in the vanilla extract yeah yeah it yeah. actually devolves dissolves but so just listening to the things there it's like mm, sour cream that would add a bunch of acid mm-hmm, that could mm-hmm. actually that could actually dissolve a whole bunch of flavors otherwise. it's it's great stuff no the lemon is zinging here so uh all right we'll keep trading recipes kevin as always and i always. Appre- appreciate your time on the show thanks very much for being here kevin thank you sir All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on Seattle News Views and Brews. The next time you want to know what's going on in local politics, give us a listen and find out what's brewing. Reach us via email at seattlenewsviewsandbrews at gmail.com. Subscribe on iTunes or Spotify. Please support us on Patreon if you like what you're hearing. And thanks for listening. Seattle News Views and Brews is an independent production of Callanan Media Services. Copyright 2020.